You're listening to Listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Ri Ray Yu. And today we have an author chat with Tao Tai, the author of Banyan Moon, her debut novel that just came out on June 27th about three generations of Vietnamese women and the decaying Gothic mansion in Florida that ties them all together. We had a really great conversation with Tao about her book that I really enjoyed reading. It was such a good like follow up to our May book club pick on the fortunes of jaded women. Um, you know, this one's less funny, but just as like emotionally impactful. Yeah, I thought it was really like it, it was strange timing. You know, I was just <laughs> like, oh, like um, it's it's the same topic. It's multi generational um, story about. Vietnamese American mothers and daughters and there's something about mother daughter stories that are just like I don't know they have a chokehold on us maybe it's because uh, there's just so many uh, secrets that we've kept over the years that like writers just keep excavating them um, so uh, I had a really good time reading this book the prose was uh, just beautiful and it's a very atmospheric book so for those of you who plan to read it i do suggest uh taking your time with it yeah we also talked to tao about her journey to becoming an author and about her inspirations in writing this um southern gothic novel about vietnamese american women so please enjoy our conversation with tao tai And we are here with Tao Tai, the author of Banyan Moon. Welcome to the show, Tao. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. So we always love to start our author chats with learning more about, you know, our authors and how they, you know, became a published author. So can you share with us your story on how you um, became a, a novelist? Absolutely. So for me, it was a very roundabout path. Um I grew up as a reader, as many of us writers do, and was at the library all the time. I was like calling those huge babysitters club books in my backpack everywhere, um, hiding them under my bed, all, all that good stuff. And so I just thought authors were the coolest thing ever. But I came from this little town on the Florida coast, and I didn't know anybody who worked in any creative field, much less writing. And so it felt extremely out of reach for me. And I didn't, I, I wrote sh short stories for myself. I remember I wrote this really weird story about like a ghost dog haunting a pool when I was seven. I thought it was like the creepiest, but coolest thing. Um, and so I would do it for myself, but I didn't have a real projection of what that might look like in the future. And then in my college application, it was, um, I applied to two schools, which is ridiculous, but I just didn't know any better. One of them was the University of Florida, close to where I was, and the other was the University of Chicago, which is very far away. And for my essay, instead of writing a real essay, I just wrote a short story that was like very much based on Ayn Rand, <laughs> which now I'm kind of like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But I, so I think I had always had this rhythm of storytelling inside of me by family. I come from a group of really talented storytellers. So I thought about it. And then eventually I went into a, um, a master's program with a focus in creative writing. But I kept thinking to myself, because I hadn't really seen models of this in my life. And, um, you know, as an immigrant kid, it, it wasn't like, something my family was pushing me towards. They weren't like, go become a writer, go soar. Um, they were like, no, you should probably be a, be a pharmacist. <laughs> um, so I, I was really uncertain and I ended up getting into book design because I figured, you know, it could be a way for me to at least be around books if I couldn't be the writer of them. And then I did that for a few years 
I went into an MFA program for fiction. And um, after the fiction program, I just didn't feel the confidence that I think a lot of my peers did coming out of it. I just didn't know that I was ready to have a book in the world. I, I don't think I had found my voice at that point. So I actually stopped writing for a good 10 years. And during that time, I was designing, I was doing web programming, I was doing book cover design, whatever I could kind of scrounge together. And um, after I gave birth to my daughter about seven years ago, I just started reading for fun again. And I actually started with romance novels. I hadn't read them as a kid. It was like something that was totally off limits to me. Like, I think my my mom would have had a fit if she had seen like a Daniel Steele cover anywhere in a three mile radius of me. So, um, so yeah, I started reading and I, I fell back in love with books again. And of course, I, I branched back into a lot of the literary work I had been reading um, early on in my career and slowly started putting essays out there, um, started working on this novel. And my agent sort of found me my chance. She said she was reading a lot of work online and she would like, before she saw the byline, she would hear something in the words that felt really familiar, which is when she realized that it a lot of the work that she was drawn to was my work. So we met for coffee and, you know, I, I had had um, a few chapters of the book written, but that meeting really made me feel like, oh, this is something people actually do. They actually go and get agents and get published. And, you know, I don't have any connections, but maybe this could work out for me. Um, and so, yeah, we, I ended up finishing the book. She liked it. And that's, that's the long story. I love that you worked in book design. Like that's such a, like, I feel like in creative writing, it always seems like people take a different path. You know, there's like mm -hmm. a wall and, you know, people find a crack and they squeeze themselves through. Yeah. And then like that crack is like papered over and people have to find a different way to get in. And this is the first time I've heard uh, of like a book designer getting into writing. So I thought that was very interesting. What did you think about your own cover? Oh, I loved it. Oh my gosh. I'm looking at it right now. It's um, the most beautiful cover. I, um, they asked for some ideas. And so having been a designer before I did the most obnoxious thing you could do. And I put <laughs> together like an eight page PDF that had like color scheme and things I didn't want and like themes. Um, but you know, my cover designer was such a dream. Um, and the, the art actually is a painting from um, an artist named Tanya Ho. And she um, went to school really close to where I grew up on the Florida coast. So we were, we were like maybe 15 minutes away from each other. And so she was inspired by these banyan trees as well, which is what's on the cover now. And actually as a publication gift, my sweet friends went in together and they bought me the original painting. So now it's hanging outside my office and it's just oh my God, that's so very sweet. special. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's absolutely the best cover. As soon as it landed in my inbox, I texted my agent and I said, this is perfect. Do you agree? And she said, I agree. And within 10 minutes, we were like, okay, great. No changes. Perfect. We love it. <laughs> it was a dream process, which actually I was a little worried about because having been a designer before, I thought I would be obnoxious. I mean, all uh, all evidence seemed to point in that direction, but I, it, it worked out great. You say obnoxious, but as someone who like I, I, I do events um, or I plan events for for the last decade. And when I get someone who knows what I need to do my job and like prepares all for me. It's like the best thing ever. So I'm sure your designer was very happy with your detailed like notes. That's true. I do like sometimes having that vision be very clear for everyone. I think it, it helps. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you grew up in uh, the coast of Florida and mm -hmm. I grew up in Georgia. So yay, okay. Southern Asians. I <laughs> yes. just wanted to ask you like, what was, what was it like growing up there? Like, were, did you grow up in, like, an enclave uh, where there were a lot of Asian Americans or mm -hmm. was it, like, mostly uh, white people and you were the minority? Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. I think at various times it seemed very much like I was the minority. But I think it was just that my family was a little bit reclusive. They weren't very social. Um, it You know, they didn't make friends outside of the family system. So I think if I had 
been in a different context and sought it out more, I would have found a lot more diversity. But to me, it felt like I was one of the only, um, I think growing up when I was in, in grade school, I was one of maybe three Asian Americans in my, in my class. So, um, not a huge group of people. And so in some ways it was, it was hard, of course, because you, you want to see representations of you, yourself. You want that community. But I felt so assured in a lot of ways with my family and their traditions that it, was very much like stepping out of one world into another. It didn't feel so much as like an integration, so much as like two different um, places that you could inhabit as a kid. I don't know. Did it feel that way in Georgia to you? Um, It's a little bit different because uh, there are a lot of Korean Americans in Georgia. Like, so I did grow up in an enclave, but like you said, there were like parts where it seemed like two different worlds and you just kind of had to like navigate and code switch a lot. So yeah, like um, it, it is a very uh, relatable experience. And, you know, like, I think, I think being from the South, it's, it's always a different, it's a different kind of, uh, of like adolescence we go through Mm. compared to East coast Asians and West Mm. coast Asians. Uh, just, just in my opinion. Um, so for your debut novel, um, Banyan Moon, do you think you can tell our listeners what it's about? Just like an elevator pitch? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Banyan Moon, it spans three generations. Um, it begins with the grandmother Min, um, the mother Hung, and her daughter Anne. And the book travels from Vietnam to America and back again. And um, it's told through a rotating first person perspective. So you get to see a little bit of the stories and secrets unfold through each character. The book opens with Anne, who is um, living this really cushy life for herself in the Midwest. She's, you know, got this perfect boyfriend, this perfect career. Her house is beautiful. And uh, but she's feeling very distant from it all. And on the night that she learns she's pregnant, she also learns of her boyfriend's infidelity. So she's heartbroken and she doesn't know how to proceed. And then very soon after she receives the news that her beloved grandmother Min has died. So she has to return home to Florida to the swamplands to this crumbling, huge old manor called the Banyan House. And there she encounters her estranged mother, Hung, and they have to figure out a way to communicate again amidst all this stuff that Min has accumulated over the decades. And of course, just as things are starting to kind of even out and go well, Anne discovers a locked trunk in the attic, and that trunk holds this devastating secret that kind of ripples through all their lives and changes the way they look at each other. So it's a little bit family drama. It's a little bit Southern Gothic. (laughs) So a tiny touch of a ghost story, too. A little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what inspired you to write Banyan Moon? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I had started writing this during the pandemic at a time when I w- we were all kind of at home and really grappling with what it means to be so isolated from each other. So something about that really interested me. And I started thinking a lot about houses, the stuff they contain, the inheritances, the secrets, um, all the history and memories in these old houses. And I've never really lived in a house like that myself, but I think they can hold great power and great intrigue, of course, a perfect setting for a novel. So I was thinking a lot about these topics. And at the same time, my grandparents had just sold their the home that they had lived in for many years in Georgia, actually. And they had given away their inheritance as well. And so I was thinking a lot about what it meant to to go through that process of deciding what to keep and deciding what to take with you. And not just in terms of objects, but in terms of, you know, the burdens and the traumas that you take with you. And so when I started this novel, I was actually thinking a lot of it would be from men's perspective. I had this image of this ghost watching from beyond the grave as um, 
things were happening around her. And she is such, I mean, you've read the book, you know, she's such a sort of like ferocious matriarch and she's like borderline controlling. She wants to like have her hands and everything. And I was just thinking how frustrating it would be for her to be watching her funeral and not be able to like micromanage where things went and what food would be served and, you know, not being able to try to get Hung and Anne to talk. And what a strange dynamic that would be to both exist in a space and yet not be able to influence in it in any way. So it grew from there to include all three women's perspectives, but that's kind of the the root of it. Yeah. And I love the, like you mentioned, the, the, the Southern Gothic like vibes of your book. That's exactly what I was thinking when I realized that the story would take place in like a giant like Southern mansion. Um, what drew you to kind of those influences? Absolutely. So um, like Rira, I, I grew up in the South. And so, you know, a lot of the literature and English classes were Southern Gothic novels. And so I was really interested in this idea that they all seemed to inhabit of place. It just really takes over the novels and it, it becomes central to to be being a kind of receptacle for the character's emotions and experiences. And so there's also this element of alienation and transgression in a lot of Southern Gothic literature. And I felt like there was an interesting parallel there between that and the experience of the diaspora in which you you feel a similar sense of displacement and also almost like being at war with your surroundings and trying to make your place within sometimes hostile circumstances. So the weird juxtaposition between those two ideas really captivated me. And I I wanted to see if we could set an immigrant story in the South and play on a lot of those old traditions, but still bring the Vietnamese-ness of of the narrative to the book too. Yeah. I mean, we've read a lot of Vietnamese American authors for this book club and for our podcast. And there's this common theme on a lot of, especially when it comes to like refugee stories about like the ghosts of the war, the ghost of Mm. the refugee experience, kind of like a a refugee gothic theme Mm. (laughs) that goes along. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading a lot of Violet Coopersmith's work. I don't know if you've read any of her, but she she writes like literal ghost stories where they're on the page and on mopeds and um, doing all these shenanigans. And so I I love her work and I love that idea that you're talking about, about these ghosts that, that remain behind. That's so powerful. Yeah, I mean, I love anything that is gothic. So like <laughs> when I heard that it was about, you know, Asian Americans living in this decaying gothic home in like, the swamp in the middle of nowhere. I was like, wow, this is like a perfect uh, setting for a ghost story. Um, And it's also like weird timing that uh, we are talking to you about this book because our last last month's book club pick was Caroline, uh, Carolyn Huynh's The Fortunes of Jaded Women, which is also a story about, uh, you know, multiple generations of Vietnamese American women and uh, motherhood and daughterhood. Um, So can you like tell us like how each generation in your book expresses motherly love and how you went about developing uh, their love language? Sure. So first of all, I love Carolyn's work. I I really enjoyed The Fortunes of Jaded Women and we've become friends and and texting partners. So I um I'm just so lucky to know her. She's she's great. Um so in terms of the women in this novel, I somebody actually asked me the other day what I thought their love languages would be and I thought that was such an interesting thought exercise. I think um, men being this very ferocious kind of active person, her love language would certainly be um, actions. You know, she would want to see things done in the way that she asked them to be done. She would want to see um, propulsion. She would want to see things moving forward. I think because of the way she grew up as such a survivor and having to be a single mom and, and raise her kids, she would really appreciate the sense of somebody living up to their words. She's so practical in that way. And Hung, she's got a little bit of the romantic in her. I think that, you know, um, she dreamed of this very 
lovely nuclear family. And even when that becomes threatened, she isn't quite ready to let go of it for a long time. And so I I think that she would need the words of validation. She is very much somebody who, um, who requires that. And partially because I think men is not that person. You know, sometimes we look for the things that we didn't get in our childhood, the the gaps in our hearts that, you know, our families couldn't fill. And I think for whom that was verbal affirmation. And then Anne, um, she being an artist and being somebody who um, expresses herself in her her body. I think she she's a a touch person. I think out of the three characters, she seems to be the one that's most embodied in terms of her experiences and her her love of of men and being by the ocean and um her even her experience of pregnancy is very visceral and very much of the body. Um so I think when you're writing a book that has these rotating first person perspectives, it can be hard to differentiate them and not have them all begin to sound alike. And so I thought a lot about who these women were before I put them on the page. Was there a perspective that was harder for you to write? Yeah, I... I really had a hard time with Hung's perspective, and I'm not quite sure why, because I'm also somebody who is very words of affirmation-y, and I I can be a romantic as well. So maybe in that way, because we were so similar, I had difficulty pulling her personality from mine. I found that she was often a passive character because she was waiting for these fairy tale scenarios to happen. And that can be very frustrating in a novel because, you know, you want your characters to be super active. Um, but I, I think eventually we got there. My editor and I worked really hard to give all three women equal time on the page. We actually in one of my edit letters, she's so, she's so wonderful. She had this long document tracing like all the page uh, space each character was taking up just so I could see precisely how neglected poor Hung was. <laughs> Inarguable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your book tells a story from three different perspectives, but it also jumps around in time as well. Um, can you talk to us about how you were able to keep like what, was the pacing of the story, like, how did that come about? Like, was it hard to figure out when to jump? Or was that always, like, part of the the, the roadmap for you? Yeah, I think I worked a lot on trying to make sure that each chapter led to the next thematically, since I knew they couldn't be chronologically linked. Like, um, for example, in a chapter where Anne might be really grappling with her pregnancy, I, if I were to switch to Hung's chapter, I would think, okay, so what is the natural segue into this? Would it be Hung like watching Anne and thinking, this is what it was like when I was pregnant with her? Would it be her projecting into the future? So it was tricky because sometimes it felt like it, I felt it was almost unwieldy, all these time jumps. But I also think that If you're telling a story that has this really clear emotional through line, that readers will be able to follow you through it, even if the chronology isn't, you know, completely laid out, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I feel like sometimes when I read books with multiple perspectives, like sometimes I find one story more compelling than the other and kind of skip Mm. ahead to like follow that character. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't get that from your book. I was bought in from chapter to chapter. So I think you, you balanced Thanks. that really well. Thank yeah. you. Um, you mentioned that uh, you had a daughter. Um, I'm just curious, like as a mother yourself, uh, what was it like writing a book about mother-daughter mm-hmm. relationships? And did you learn anything new while you were writing this book? Absolutely. I think there is something very interesting that happens when you become a mother and you are yourself a daughter. It, it's kind of you're inhabiting both spaces at once. So it almost feels like um, the two experiences are overlaid on top of one another, by which I mean that if I'm having an experience with my daughter, say I'm watching her go down a slide for the first time, a part of my brain is jogging back and thinking, 
do I remember my mom watching me go down the slide? What was that like? Am I feeling what she's feeling now? And so in in a way, I think having a daughter really opened up my empathy. I think, um, you know, I don't know if either of you went through this, but there were times when my family wasn't super expressive in the way that I saw modeled on sitcoms, you know, like mothers and daughters sitting on a, a sofa, having these confidences about boys or what have you. And so to me, I wrongly assumed that that was the model for maternal closeness. And I held that with me for a really long time, actually. And when I began to open myself up to have this kind of empathy for my my mom and my grandmother and my aunts and uncles and really think about the things that they went through. I was able to have so much more grace, not only for them, but for, for myself as a mother too. So becoming a mother was great for, for my writing because it helped me, it helped me imagine what it was like for different people in my life at different times. And in that way, it was sort of healing as well. Yeah, as a as a daughter myself of uh, of an immigrant mother, yeah, like mother daughter relationships in the immigrant circle, it's very. I don't know what else to describe it as other than mm-hmm. intense. Like mm-hmm. there is, mm-hmm. there's just like a ferocity in it, and um, you know, like my my mother used to be like, oh, like when you become a mother, you'll understand. And I'm just like, I don't know, like, (laughs) like, um, and your characters, they like, as, as they become parents themselves, they want to break the cycle of like the toxic behavior that their parents exhibited. Um, can you tell us like why you were drawn into that theme of inheritance and, uh, generational trauma? One thing that, a a fellow mother told me when I first had my daughter, she said that you're going, she said, you're going to one day understand that your mother and your grandmother, they did the best with the tools that they had. And those tools are going to be really different from the tools that you're going to grow up with. I remember feeling a little bit dismissive of that at the time. I just didn't really know what it meant. Um, But now I, I totally understand what that means. I think that I am so lucky and I am so privileged to be living the way I am. And so much of this was because of my mother's sacrifice and her strictness and um, her rules and regulations that I, I found so, uh, so hard to cope with when I was a kid. I also think that within my life, I've seen people around me change a lot and not just people of our generation. I say are, I'm an elderly millennial. Um, I'm sorry, we I, don't worry. I, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so I've seen people change a lot. And like my aunts and uncles have really softened as they've become grandparents. And my mother, she is like a different person than she was when I was a kid. She's silly and she's so giving and funny. And it, it it's like, having seen the capacity for the people in my life to evolve, that has been really transformative to me. And it was something I really wanted to explore in fiction because I don't, I don't think it's true that people stay static their whole lives. I think a lot of us can learn from our mistakes. A lot of us can learn from each other. And ultimately I wanted Banyan Moon to speak to that sense of hope um, because I've experienced it myself. And I think it's really a, a wonderful thing. Um, as much as your book is about motherhood, you also have uh, this exploration of what is fatherhood. Like, what is a good mm-hmm. father? Um, does mm-hmm. blood ties make a difference? And you have absent fathers in your book and also um, fathers who are like very loving to to their children. Uh, can you tell us about how you develop these ma- male characters in your book? Yeah, I have been fascinated with fathers all my life. My um, father uh, disappeared when I was a a baby and I haven't seen or talked to him since. 
Um, and so I've always been on the periphery sort of watching what fatherhood looks like around me. So I had my grandfather who was this incredibly loving person. He would provide me with books. Nobody would ever dare yell at me in his presence. It would be like, he would lay down the law and he'd be like, that is no, she, she will not get reprimanded in front of me. Um, and then I, you know, I saw a lot of absent fathers as well, including my own, of course. And so there's a real spectrum and I'm lucky to have a husband now who's very involved. And so I think that really shapes the way children grow up in terms of their understanding of their identity, as well as what they want in life. And I think that can create some really interesting tensions in terms of um, trying, as we talked about before, trying to fill the gaps that you've had in childhood. So I, I was really thinking about a lot of that, especially when it came to Anne and what she didn't have and what she did have as well. She had this beautiful circle of women who loved her so fiercely. Um, but Swan, uh, Hung's, Hung's father, she, he, is just this gentle, loving, beautiful person. And I wanted to make sure to have somebody like him in the novel as well, because I do believe that there is such an endless capacity for love within fathers as there is within mothers as well, even if I personally didn't experience it myself. One thing that I really enjoyed while reading your book is the, I guess, some of the more nuanced scenes of like Asian parent-child relationship. I'm thinking specifically of a scene where um, Hong is trying to teach and how to make a dish over the phone and not really <laughs> giving the measurements needed because that's not how Asian parents cook. Um, can you tell us what were some of the, your favorite things that you added for flavor? Thank you for pointing out that moment. I, I love that moment too. And that one might have been taken straight from life. <laughs> My mom has taken to texting me recipes now. So they... And they're just one she makes up on the fly. I'm like, you did not measure this. You just like <laughs> said two tablespoons. I'm pretty sure that's like not something you actually measured. Um, so there'll be like long, long messages where she just types it out very stream of consciousness. <laughs> and I, I've taken to actually printing them out and putting them in a recipe book because I just cherish it so much. It's so lovely. Um, but, but yeah, that's definitely one of them. And I think that moment when... Hung and Anne are arguing about the altar um, after Min has died and they're trying to figure out what to put in the altar and they're bickering like, oh, she would not want coffee. That's not traditional. That photo doesn't look like her. I feel like that might be true to life as well. I think that even in our moments of greatest grief, we're still sort of um, trying to mark our territory with one another. And a lot of times that comes through in us saying things like, well, I knew her better than you knew her. Like this version of this person who's passed away is more authentic in my mind than in yours. And I could, I could see myself having a lot of those same conversations too. Um, so moments like that really, really endeared me to the women. <laughs> Yeah, endeared the women I, to me. <laughs> one of one of my favorite parts was uh, when Anne is trying to cook a dish for Noah, her longtime boyfriend, and her mom's just like, "He's not gonna like the food that you're gonna cook. Like that's a white boy right there. He's not gonna <laughs> appreciate good Vietnamese cuisine." <laughs> and just how like, like I I like Noah as a character too because he is so earnest and so oblivious at the same time and i was like okay yeah that's pretty much how it is in a lot of um interracial relationships there's a lot of um miscommunication yes. and it's just because like you don't share the same experience so there's just a lot of um like i said miscommunication and gaps in in uh understanding culture <laughs> absolutely and my uh, my husband is Caucasian, and when we first went to Georgia to visit my grandparents for the first time, it was a huge deal because when they didn't know he existed, we were just like, we got engaged, and we were like, 
way. Oh, fun. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That's the way you do it. Um, so then they, of course, made this huge feast. And in Vietnamese culture, there are some dishes that are a little pungent. Like there's this one called mum, um, which is like kind of a fermented fish and shrimp dish. And they were adamant about not serving it to him. They were like, no, no, no. We'll just like, you can eat it in the garage where he won't, he won't see or smell it. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hide myself from the man I'm about to marry. And so he, he tried it. And to this day, they still are like, they'll, they'll talk about it in these odd tones. They'll be like, and then he ate the fish sauce. Like, like he's <laughs> like this, this hero. <laughs> So they they like that he'll eat anything. But yes, I think that certainly happens a lot of those gaps and miscommunications. Yeah. I mean, best way to uh, win the approval of your Asian in-laws is to enjoy their food. And oh, half honestly. of the hurdle is, you know, you, you've done like half the challenge. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's it's actually so easy. I mean, I, if I could write a handbook for interracial marriage, I'll just be like, just eat everything and just eat a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, well, your title, uh, Banyan Moon, is actually a reference to a Vietnamese folktale uh, that uh, Huang tells um, Anne when uh, when there's like a distressing situation in the book. Uh, what inspired you to like interweave that folktale into your book? I grew up around a lot of folktales, I think because my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my mom grew up in such a fraught time in Vietnam they really leaned on storytelling as a way to get through things and not only in sort of this escapist way, but to honor a lot of the traditions that they were fighting for and the things that they held dear. It was sort of a reminder of what all these things meant. So I grew up around folk tales, and I've always loved the power they contain and how they almost become a space of the imagination where we can all drop in and exist together, um, regardless of our specific context. So I really wanted to have that in the book, but I didn't know exactly how to weave that in. I was playing with um, the the Bluebeard fable with the um, the locked doors and beheaded women, <laughs> um, and that didn't quite work out. But uh, when I came across the story of Chukoi, the man in the moon, I was really interested in the mention of the banyan moon because I had always, you know, thought about these banyan trees based on where I grew up and they were a big part of the novel. And banyan trees grow in both Vietnam and Florida. They don't grow a lot of places stateside. They're actually, I think it's actually illegal to plant them now because they're viewed as an invasive species. And so the singularity of that um, and kind of the perfect symmetry of this tree existing in both places and this fable that united them both, it was just irresistible to me. So it really, actually, I, I would say that finding that fable and settling on the banyan tree as the the place metaphor, that was really what shaped it into a book for me, as opposed to this thing, this word document I was working on on the side at night. Yeah, I thought it like provided a lot of structure to your book. And mm. also like your prose is lush and gorgeous. So like it really did have like this folktale quality uh, to it. So I, I really thought that was pretty impressive. You. Yeah, I got my daughter this book of Vietnamese folk tales. It's like a children's book, and she hasn't been as interested in it as I would like, <laughs> but I've been looking through it fascinated. So, I mean, maybe she'll get interested in it when she's older. I, yes. Yeah, I've seen that happen where, um, you know, our heritage is not as interesting as we think until we become older and we understand that uh, those stories are treasures. So, yes. Yeah, exactly. Here's hoping. So a big plot point in your book is that Anne and Hong both inherit the Banyan house from Min. Um, and, you know, I thought, um, what was the, there was a book we read recently, too, where like a grandmother, uh, it was Carolyn Quinn's Fortunate Jaded Women, where the grandmother actually writes out a will who gets what, which is still kind of like 
I feel like that's not something a lot of Asian like elders do. It's like lay out who gets what. And you, you end up with a lot of just families fighting with each other to like to claim what's theirs. Uh, but, you know, what stuck out to me is Hong has a brother, Fook, who kind of just swoops in and assumes he'll get the house and like starts making a fuss. And I feel like that was such a like, I don't know if that's something that's happened to you in real life, but I feel like I've heard that happen more than once especially with like asian families uh where like the inheritance i guess rights aren't laid out exactly yeah no i and again it just terrifies me just because i'm also very um type a you know i kind of like things to be super clear and so the idea of you walking into a situation where everyone's emotions are already so high and having to like fight for something in this way. It just really makes me uncomfortable. But I do see it a lot because sometimes I feel like it's not even about the stuff. You know, it's not even about the Banyan house. That's not really what he's upset about. He's upset because he's just never felt loved in the same way that that Hung and Anne were. He he's he feels like he's missed out on something and his only way of reclaiming it is by snatching this big house back and to make that a part of his life in some way. So I think a lot of times inheritance when it comes to like wills and things like that, it's really a fight over, over the deceased's love and memories more than it is about the stuff. Sometimes it is about the stuff, but my grandparents actually, decided to move to Vietnam a few years ago and they prematurely gave everything away. Um, But they were hoarders. So it would be like um, these beautiful, like stainless steel sets from Macy's, but they were from the 1980s that they had saved in this room. And so they were actually in a position where they kept trying to give things away. And we kept being like, no, we're good. We all have our, we all have our cookware already, grandma. I'm sorry. So now there's just like all this stuff and it's in storage, but I could tell that they wanted so badly to be able to, you know, give things and to provide us with some kind of scaffolding for our lives. But because we were all adults, we were sort of like, well, we (laughs) have all this already, you know? So I think there's also a lot of hope when it comes to those situations too. You, you want to be able to pass these things along. They, they have jewelry set aside for my daughter, you know, and she's only seven. She doesn't even have her ears pierced and she's got diamond ear, you know, like it, it's just, there's so much love and hope there. And then there's a lot of ugliness and fraught stuff that can happen too. So that um, when there's just so much of that emotion in one circumstance, I feel like that just makes for great fiction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, grief is a, Grief comes in different forms and Mm -hmm. it can be really ugly and people say a lot of hurtful things when they are in pain. And I Mm -hmm. thought you um, portrayed grief beautifully in this book because, um, you know, Anne and Huang, they're always, you know, they think they knew uh, Min like better than the other, Mm -hmm. like you like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it is like when when someone you love passes away. I feel like you have rose tinted glasses and you don't really see the full picture, like the full portrait of them as a as a flawed person. And I thought your book did a really good job um, just showing like just showing like what forgiveness is and how hard it can be. And um, and just like, I I don't know, it was very optimistic. Um, like you said, people change. And um, as this very cynical person, I was like, oh, OK, like <laughs> relationships can be repaired. And uh, that is something that I feel like a lot of children of immigrants, like they struggle with because uh, some scars run really deep. And mm-hmm. uh, grief, like I said, is very uh, painful and ugly sometimes. So uh, seeing a story where things can be undone it was it was really optimistic sorry that's not a question I just wanted to uh compliment (laughs) you on that (laughs) that's lovely that's lovely and I want to be clear that I I definitely think two things can exist at once and I do think sometimes the scars are so deep and perhaps there's it perhaps it seems impossible that 
you could repair it or even make the advance towards making these moves. And I think that's okay too. Sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is separate yourself. And I fully believe that as well. So I don't, I never want my book to feel prescriptive or to be like overly Pollyanna. I think relationships are just so complicated and however we make our way through them and find a way to see each other, that's all we can do in this life really. Yeah. So we're recording this episode right before, a week before your book drops. And you're probably listening to this episode after the book drops. But uh, what are you most looking forward to uh, when this book gets out into the world? Yeah, so it, um, because it was a book of the month pick, a few people have already gotten it into their hands and have started reading it already. And the thing that every time like sends this huge spark sparkly cloud towards me is like when someone DMs me and they say, I am still thinking about the trans women or I'm still like, I I wonder where they're at or what they're doing. And I care about them so much. And that's exactly my experience of them. I know every author kind of feels like their characters are their babies, but sometimes like before I go to sleep, I'll sit there and I'll be like, hmm. I wonder, like, I wonder if little Ben is like growing up by the ocean still, you know, like I have this thought as if they're like actual people I know. And so just the thought of readers getting to encounter them in this way and, and being able to connect with them as if they were people who matter to them, that feels both special and unbelievable. (laughs) I can't wait. Yeah. I mean, there's only one solution. Banyan Moon 2. Banyan's son. I mean, yeah. Why <laughs> not? Son. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the pun. I love it. Yeah. I love well, it. I mean, it seems like you're getting a lot of uh, praise, early praise for your book. Um, I mean, the first time I heard about uh, Banyan Moon was actually through Nicole Chung. Um, yes, she had an interview wonderful. with uh, Rumpus and she mentioned your book saying, like, she's like, oh my God, I'm obsessed with this book. And I was like, huh, okay. Like... <laughs> Nicole so, is amazing. I got yeah, to be Nicole on a panel with her and she's just so smart and her books are just so good. I feel like we are just in such a golden age of Asian American literature right now in, in all genres, poetry, fiction, memoir, um, essays. It's just, it's incredibly exciting to be working right now. Yeah. Speaking of working right now, are you working on a second book or are you mostly working on essays right now? I am. Yes. I'm very excited about this new book. It's new. It's a literary thriller. So it's got, um, the pacing is a little different. I'm learning a lot of new skills, but, um, as with Banyan Moon, the characters are the most important thing to me. So it's been really fun working on this. I guess on that note, um, thank you so much for joining us, Tao. It's such, it was such a pleasure to speak with you and yeah, Good luck slash congratulations on your book launch. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure, Marvin and Rira. This is one of my first podcasts and I just, you you made me feel instantly at home and this was so fun. So I really uh, appreciate thank you. this. Thank you. And that was Tao Tai, the author of Banyan Moon, um, available now at bookstores everywhere, including the Books and Boba Bookshop. Um, as always, if you purchase a book off of our online bookstore, you support not only your local bookstore, but also us at Books and Boba. And another way to support Books and Boba um, is to join our Patreon. Um, Books and Boba Patreon subscribers get access to our members-only Discord. And if you join at the $5 level as a Honey Boba member, you also get um, access to our monthly Boba chat where Rira and I and sometimes the guests uh, will talk about things that are, you know, non-book related. Before we go, um, just a quick reminder that our July 2023 book club pick is The Imaginary Lives of James Ponicky a novel by Tina Macaretti about a Maori boy who dreams of seeing the world and um, does so by agreeing to become a British man's living exhibit in Victorian England. So yeah, excited to talk about this book about um, colonialism and cultural exploitation. Um, As always, if you've already finished the book, um, let us know your thoughts in our Goodreads forums or our Discord server. Uh, We always love to include feedback from our audience in our podcast as often as we can. And with that, thanks for listening to this episode of Books and Boba. Thanks again to Tao Tai for chatting with us on this episode. And don't forget to pick up her book, Banyan Moon, available now at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Podcast Asians in Baseball alongside Naomi Ko and Scott Okamoto. Asians in Baseball is exactly what it sounds like a podcast about the Asian and Asian Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Americans in Major League Baseball. Every week, we break down the highlights of what's going on with Asians in Baseball and then take a deeper dive into the Asian and Asian Americans past and present who have shaped baseball as it is today. Whether you're Kim Ang's number one fan or you've never even heard of Hideo Nomo, we've got something for everyone. Especially for the Shohei Otani stands. Maybe too much for the Shohei Otani stands. Listen to Asians in Baseball wherever you get podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.